Can I do anything for you? You do too much. College, a job, all this time with me. You're not Superman, you know. Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. If somebody said it was a happy little tale, if somebody told you I was just your average, ordinary guy, not a care in the world, somebody lied. To encode an entirely new genome, combining the genetic information from all three spiders into these 15 genetically designed super spiders. There's 14. One's missing. Uh, Peter, may I introduce my father, Norman Asborn? Heard so much about you. Great honor to meet you, sir. Harry tells me you're quite the science whiz. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. The performance enhancers aren't ready. The data just doesn't justify this test. 40,000 years of evolution and we barely even tapped the vastness of human potential. Huh. Uh, can I take your picture? I need one with a student in it. Sure. I know, I went through exactly the same thing at your age. Are you all right? Uh, I'm fine. No, not exactly. So where are you going after you graduate? I want to move into the city. What other skills do you have, Parker? I was thinking of something in photography. I'd like a job, sir. No jobs? Freelance. Best thing in the world for a kid your age. These are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become the rest of his life. What the hell was that? What was that thing? Whatever it is, somebody has to stop it. Remember, with great power, Great responsibility. Who are you? Your friendly neighborhood Spider Man. On the 3rd of May 2002, Spider-Man swung onto the big screen and crawled his way to the box office making $821 million worldwide. It broke box office records on its opening day weekend, was the most successful film that year in the USA and is to this day the most successful origin story of a superhero at the box office. The film didn't arrive in the UK until a month later and was given the 12 rating by the BBFC. Sony were pushing for a PG for its UK market, but the BBFC felt the violence was too graphic for younger viewers. However, that year the BBFC did introduce a 12A rating, which allowed younger viewers to attend screenings accompanied by an adult. Sony decided to re-release the film two months later with the new rating to help boost profits and to take advantage of the younger fanbase. After the terrorist attacks on the United States on September 11th, 2001, Sony recalled teaser posters which showed a close-up of Spider-Man's face, with New York's World Trade Center towers reflected in his eyes. The film's original teaser trailer was removed from previews. The teaser didn't contain much footage from the actual film, but mostly exclusive material, very much like the T2 teaser from 1991. It featured a mini-plot involving a group of bank robbers escaping in a helicopter which gets caught in a giant net. The camera pulls back to reveal a gigantic spider web spun between the World Trade Center towers. The two towers do feature in the film in one quick shot as Spider-Man looks quickly at camera. 
Spider-Man hadn't had much luck with live action features and shows. The greatest success came with the arrival of the Spider-Man cartoon in 1994, which ran for five seasons. During the late 70s, CBS had commissioned a series that was loosely based on the character. It didn't last long despite large viewing figures. The network wasn't particularly happy with a lot of kids tuning in and wanted their content to appeal to adults. Nicholas Hammond stepped into the role of Peter Parker and Spider-Man, and he was the Spidey I grew up on. The show didn't have many episodes, totalling 14 in all. Some were packaged together and released as a movie in parts of the world. These were made on TV budgets. They are very cheap and don't feature any of the classic villains from the comics. It was just a show with Spider-Man battling crooks. I watched many of these when the BBC repeated them in the late 80s and early 90s. Marvel Comics weren't doing very well financially during the 80s and sold many licenses to film studios to option movies on their catalogue of characters. Canon Films had picked up Captain America and Spider-Man, but also Superman from the Soul Kinds, who had optioned him from DC Comics in the 70s. Canon Films had started pre-production on Spider-Man with director Joe Zito, but during the later part of the 80s, Canon Films were struggling with their finances, resulting from too many box office bombs. Superman 4 failed due to heavy budget cuts. Spider-Man's budget was then slashed from $20 million to $7 million, which resulted in Joe Zito leaving the project. Director Albert Pion, who would later go on to direct Captain America, was given the task of shooting Spider-Man and the intended sequel to Masters of the Universe, which was later dropped in favour of making Cyborg. There was a small amount of publicity for the Canon Films version of Spider-Man, some press photos and a comic with stuntman Scott Lever as Spider-Man, but it never got to the shooting stage as Canon needed to save money and cancelled the production. After leaving Canon Films, Menachem Golan set up 21st Century Films and was still pursuing the idea of a Spider-Man feature. A number of scripts were written but never got produced. James Cameron had wanted to develop a Spider-Man movie but didn't own the rights. Karolko Pictures, who produced Terminator 2 and Cliffhanger, had an arrangement with 21st Century Films to share distribution. Jim Cameron had developed a large 47-page treatment, which focused on the villains such as Doc Ock and Sandman. He introduced the idea of the organic web shooters, so instead of creating the web himself, it comes out of his wrist, which the Sam Raimi movie took on come 2002. By 1995, MGM had acquired the 21st Century Films library and assets, so they became the owners of all the drafts written over the years. Karolko were having money problems. After the box office disaster cut Throat Island and filed for bankruptcy, which halted James Cameron's Spider-Man. In 1998, Marvel were finally out of their financial troubles, with them teaming up with the toy manufacturer Toy Biz, and the rights of Spider-Man had reverted back to them, which didn't please MGM. They contested this in court but lost. Marvel sold the Spider-Man rights to Columbia Pictures. James Cameron's script was never going to be used, but a number of elements were borrowed by David Kep, who took sole writing credit for the movie, which was approved by the Screenwriters Guild, despite many others contributing to the latest revisions. Many top directors were considered for directing the movie, such as Tony Scott and David Fitcher, but they settled on Sam Raimi, who was a huge fan of the comics and had prior experience with his own superhero creation, Dark Man. The movie does have a large cast, but I'm going to focus on the characters who have an important role to the story and a couple that deserve a mention. We have Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. Tobey was cast as Peter in July 2000, shortly after Sam Raimi got the job of directing. Sam was impressed with Tobey's performance in the Cider House Rules, although Tobey was not familiar with the character and had never read any comics when he grew up. To prepare for the role, Maguire did a lot of training. He hired a physical trainer, a yoga instructor, a martial arts expert, and took on rock climbing before shooting to improve his physique. For the DVD and Blu-ray, his screen test is available, and it's very odd. It's like they are creating a scene from a Bruce Lee movie. This was done to demonstrate that Toby could handle himself in the action scenes. Kirsten Dunst plays Mary Jane Watson, the girl who Peter Parker had a crush on since he was six years old. Mary Jane aspires to become an actress, but ends up a waitress at a rundown diner, a fact she hides from her new boyfriend, Harry. Sam Raimi was aiming to cast Alicia Witt, but after Kirsten's screen test, she successfully got the role. Willem Dafoe plays the Green Goblin, and Norman Osborn, owner of Oscorp Industries. Dafoe was cast as Osborn in November 2000, after Nicolas Cage and John Malkovich turned down the role. Defoe had lobbied to get the part and insisted on wearing the uncomfortable costume. 
to help convey the character's body language, which he felt a stuntman couldn't do. Defoe didn't realise the suit would be so heavy and was often exhausted after shooting. James Franco plays Harry Osborne, Peter's best friend who starts dating Mary Jane Watson once they move to New York. Franco had originally wanted to play the part of Spider-Man, but after his screen test, Sam Raimi thought he would be ideal for the role of Harry. Cliff Robertson, who sadly passed away in 2011, plays Ben Parker, Peter's uncle. Cliff was an experienced actor of film and TV. Spider-Man 3 would be his last on-screen role. Ben Parker has recently lost his job as an electrician and is trying to find a new one, but at his age, he thinks it's going to be a struggle to find anything to support the family. Rosemary Harris plays May Parker. Rosemary was in her late 70s when she took on the role of Aunt May. She has been acting since 1948, appeared in dozens of films but is best known for her work in theatre. After the death of Ben, she becomes closer to Peter and tries to encourage him to open up to Mary Jane and tell her his feelings. J.K. Simmons plays J. Jonah Jameson, the grumpy and short-tempered publisher of the Daily Bugle. He hires Peter on a freelance basis to provide photos of Spider-Man, because Peter is the only one who can take a decent photo of him. Having J.K. Simmons play J.J. was probably the finest casting I have ever seen in a film. He is Jonah Jameson. You bring me some more shots of that newspaper selling clown, maybe I'll take him off your hands. But I never said you have a job. Meet. I'll send you a nice box of Christmas meat. Best I can do. Get out of here. The legendary Bruce Campbell makes a cameo. Bruce often pops up in Sam's movies, due to them being very good friends and colleagues. He plays the announcer at the wrestling ring Peter takes part in, and he gives him the name of Spider-Man. We have the late macho man Randy Savage as the wrestler Bonesaw. He challenges Peter in the ring and doesn't realise how strong he is, and gets his ass handed to him. Ted Raimi is director Sam Raimi's younger brother. He plays a small role as Jameson's assistant, Hoffman. Now we all know the story of how Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man. It's a simple origin story that is effectively told in Sam Raimi's movie. Peter and Harry join their classmates for a visit to a genetics laboratory to be shown a new breed of super spider. Peter has always had a crush on his neighbour Mary Jane. He asks her to pose for a photo for the school paper, but one of the super spiders has escaped and as he takes a few snaps it lands on his hand and bites him. He heads home feeling unwell. He begins to hallucinate and passes out. Meanwhile, Harry's father Norman Osborn is battling with the military to secure an important contract. He fails to impress them due to the performance enhancing chemicals requiring more testing. He decides to experiment on himself and he goes insane. Peter awakens the next morning to find he no longer requires glasses and his physique has changed dramatically. While eating lunch at school, he discovers he can produce webs and has the ability to sense danger. Spooked out, he leaves school and begins practicing his new powers, crawling up the walls and leaping across the buildings, brushing off Uncle Ben's advice that with great power comes great responsibility. Peter leaves him on a sour note, thinking only of impressing Mary Jane with a new car. He enters an underground fighting tournament and wins his first match, but the promoter swindles him out of his money. A thief suddenly raids the promoter's office, but Peter allows him to escape, feeling cheated. Is it me or does the thief look a bit like director Luke Besson? Moments later, he discovers that Uncle Ben was carjacked and has been shot, and he passes away. Peter, in his anger, pursues and confronts the carjacker, only to realise it was the thief he let escape. Peter quickly disarms him, but as the carjacker attempts to flee, he trips and falls to his death. Later on, a military experiment is taking place for the new contractors to test their equipment. The new hardware does look like something from the film in a space. Norman Osborn suddenly appears using his new suit and glider. He attacks them and kills them all in one fell swoop. Upon graduating, Peter begins using his abilities to fight crime, donning his new costume, which I don't know how he created. Maybe Uncle Ben left him some money after he passed away, so he could pay a costume designer to make it for him. With his new persona of Spider-Man, news begins to spread of his heroic antics, and J. Jonah Jameson, head of the Daily Bugle, hires Peter as a freelance photographer, since he is the only person providing clear images of Spider-Man. Norman learns of Oscorp's board members' plan to sell the company and vote him out. He decides to take his revenge and assassinates them all at the World Unity Fair, which Peter is attending. Spider-Man jumps into action and reveals himself to the public, saving Mary Jane in the process. J. 
Jameson is quick to capitalise on the attack and calls the mysterious killer the Green Goblin. Industry expert John Dykstra supervised the visual effects for the film, with the bulk of the computer-generated material being handled by Sony Imageworks. Sam Raimi had wanted to do a lot of the effects within camera, and had little experience with CGI at the time, but John persuaded Sam to have a large majority of the Spider-Man footage in CG form. It would have proven difficult and dangerous for a stuntman to swing high above the city within camera. John Dykstra created a test to demonstrate what could be achieved in computer animation, and Columbia Pictures and Sam were very impressed. But the movie does employ a lot of wire work for scenes of Spider-Man jumping off camera, or landing with whoever he has saved. The fight scenes have loads of practical stunts and effects, so there is a great blend of traditional and modern methods. Due to Spider-Man's costume being red and blue and Norman Osborn's suit being green, they had to use green screen for Spider-Man and blue screen for the Green Goblin to help separate the shots. So when the actors interact with each other, they avoid this problem with shooting in live action or they would be doubled in CGI. The difficulty of conveying a character as a CGI double lies in the fact he wears a mask. You don't see his eyes or mouth. So special care was taken to bring across his humanity, but also translate Spider-Man's classic poses as he swings through the city. In addition, Dykstra's crew had to composite areas of New York City, mainly for the big battle in Times Square. I think the effects have generally stood up over time, but they have dated far more quickly than, say, Spider-Man 2. The shots of Peter wearing his homemade suit do show the CGI limitations, and the battle in Times Square has many sequences that stand out as looking a bit unfinished, or at least of their time. New York looks very flat and much like a cardboard cutout city, as they have placed the balloons over the top of the footage. When Green Goblin jumps back on his glider, it's a very muddy and unfocused shot. On the plus side, the battle in the burning building is one of my favourite of the visual effects. There's a great slow motion shot as Spider-Man jumps to avoid the spinning blades, and the combination of fire, it just looks seamless. The second unit work is tremendous. They capture some fantastic swooping shots of the city, which really come into play for the final sequence of Spider-Man embracing his powers and responsibilities. Danny Elfman returns to the super genre with a solid superhero score. He hadn't worked on a comic book movie since Batman Returns in 1992. Danny had worked with Sam on Darkman, he provided the theme to Army of Darkness and also composed the score to a simple plan. The score itself has a lot of familiar Elfman motifs and cues, which you can find in Darkman, Edward Scissorhands and his work on the Tim Burton Batman movies. Sam wanted three things from Danny when it came to writing the music a heroic main theme, a theme for Peter, and a love theme. When I produced my top 10 superhero soundtracks list a few months back, I personally preferred James Horner's work on Amazing Spider-Man. That is not to say I dislike this score. I think when you have a composer work on a large selection of superhero films, you will get a lot of familiarity to the music. Because a composer can only produce a certain number of styles, and studios hire a composer because they want a particular sound that the composer is known for many times it can be seen as lazy. When studios just pick who is popular at the time and not thinking if they are the right choice to give that particular superhero its musical voice. There are many great moments in the Spider-Man score that fit the character so well, such as his first attempts to crawl up the wall, the montage as he starts saving people around New York, and many of the horror elements linked to the Green Goblin are very effective. But then there are moments that have that gothic sound, that you associate with his work for Tim Burton, which I don't feel represents Spider-Man. The strange thing is, when they started showing the trailer for the film, it has a heavy bass line and funk to it, which I thought was brilliant, and I feature it in my own opening trailer. I thought this was going to be the main theme. Then when I saw the film, it had the familiar Danny Elfman music. I wasn't upset, but a little disappointed because I had jumped the gun and thought it was going to be something else. I do really like Danny Elfman's work over the years, I think he is an interesting person, and I always enjoy listening to him discuss his work. He's very honest about his methods of composing, and addresses criticisms that have been made over the years. Over the entire trilogy, I found myself listening to Christopher Young's contributions to Spider-Man 3 more than Danny's. His style and experience in horror film scoring added an extra layer of musical sound to the Spider-Man series, and made it more refreshing to my ear. 
Like many superhero movies, they feature a number of rock and pop songs during the film and the end credits. Nickelback had a music video produced to promote the film. I'm not really a fan of the band or the track itself, but I'd rather have them included than Macy Gray. She seemed to disappear off the pop charts not long after the film came out. I don't really have a problem with contemporary songs being featured in a film, but it does tend to date the movie, whereas a big orchestral score is timeless. Danny Elfman's complete score and the soundtrack are both easily available on iTunes and on CD if you don't already have them in your collection. Spider-Man has generally been quite lucky with video game translations. The 16-bit era was a bit mixed with the Mega Drive version being the most successful with the fans and critics, but when it came to the world of 3D graphics, fans really got the chance to be able to swing through the city as the famous web crawler. A game based on the movie was released the same year for the PC, PlayStation 2, Xbox and Nintendo's GameCube, developed by Treyarch, and a Game Boy Advance version, which felt like an upgrade of the old 16-bit games, was handled by Digital Eclipse. The console versions of the game featured aerial combat for the first time, and to an extent allowed the user to web-sling over New York openly, although not being able to land on the ground below, which was later implemented in the sequel. The game included the voice of the actors from the film, including Tobey Maguire, Willem Dafoe, and everyone's favourite B-movie actor, Bruce Campbell. The voiceover acting by the cast is a bit mixed in its quality, and it appears they haven't been given much direction but having Bruce Campbell be the main voiceover was a delight. The game's storyline takes many liberties with the movie's plotline and throws in other villains from the comics to extend the game. The graphics were very good for the time and it received mostly positive reviews from the fans and critics and it sold well. For once we got a video game based on a movie that didn't suck. Due to the huge popularity of Spider-Man, a sequel was quickly greenlit by Columbia Pictures. The sequel arrived in 2004 to huge acclaim by fans and critics, with many hailing it as one of the best superhero films ever made, with Roger Ebert saying it was the best since Superman the movie. The hype for Spider-Man 3 was huge, but once it came out and the reviews were published, it left a sour taste in many people's mouths. It felt like the studio compromised it in their attempts to throw in too many characters. The script felt rushed and uneven, the tone was all over the place. It did huge numbers, but once the hype died down, many fans were disappointed with the movie, even Sam Raimi himself. Plans were afoot for Spider-Man 4, but Sam Raimi couldn't develop a script he was happy with, and the pressure from Sony Pictures was getting too much, so he decided to quit, and the plans to continue his series came to an end. Sony announced a reboot of the series with Andrew Garfield in the lead role of Spider-Man. People were very skeptical about the idea, because it was way too early for another retelling of Spider-Man's origins, and with it being announced so soon after Spider-Man 3, it felt like a quick cash grab for Sony. The film arrived in 2012 to generally positive reviews. Critics loved Garfield's performance, but many felt it took itself way too seriously, and was bogged down with too much focus on the origin story. Amazing Spider-Man 2 was released two years later, and it was all over the place with its tone. It has serious moments accompanied by slapstick, it felt like Superman 3. The movie ended up being like Spider-Man 3, stuffed with too many characters and it seemed like a desperate attempt to set up a sequel and a spin-off with a Sinister Six. The arrival of the Green Goblin was incredibly rushed, throwing him in just to kill off Gwen Stacy. This version of the Goblin, instead of wearing a mask, turns into this monster a bit like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. To be honest, he looks a lot like Pickle from the TV show Nightmare. Amazing Spider-Man 2 did good money, but its mixed reviews resulted in many involved in the series to bow out, and Garfield's Spider-Man storyline would come to a sudden end. With the arrival of Captain America's Civil War, it featured an extended cameo of Spider-Man played by Tom Holland. Sony and Marvel are now working together to kickstart Spider-Man again, with his own solo feature film called Spider-Man Homecoming, which is slated for a release in 2017. From what I saw in Civil War, Tom Holland is a fantastic choice for Spidey, and really liked what I saw of him in the film. It's too early for me to decide if he could possibly be the best interpretation of the character I've seen so far. I will reserve my judgement until Homecoming arrives. Spider-Man the movie back in 2002 was something I was really looking forward to watching. I was coming up to 20 years old. I still liked the character and never grew out of liking him, but stopped reading the comics in my early teens. What really got me excited to see it was the chance to watch a Sam Raimi movie on the big screen. 
I had just finished studying film and media at college, and the new friends I had made while I was studying all loved the Evil Dead trilogy. As soon as we heard Sam Raimi was directing, I was so excited. It was like a match made in heaven. Today it would be like Duncan Jones directing a Judge Dredd movie. You know you're in for a good ride. Sam was a guy who did great action, horror and comedy. He could easily translate those skills to Spider-Man, but also knowing he would treat the source material with respect, and he does it flawlessly. Spider-Man's origin story was always a simple tale, and the movie stays close to it but makes small alterations here and there. But in all fairness, it's very faithful. It skirts around providing lengthy character development and puts the focus of his powers centre stage. But it never forgets the heart of the story. The emotional core of Peter and his love for Mary Jane and his family remains key. The death of Ben is an important part of Peter's story arc, and Sam Raimi retains Ben's message of power and responsibility, which keeps Peter his true self. It's what motivates him and keeps him on the right path throughout the trilogy. Tobey Maguire was a very good choice for Spider-Man, and I still believe he did great work throughout the trilogy. I was happy to see him announced as Spider-Man, because I had just seen Pleasantville where he played this nerdy character who is obsessed with this classic 50s show and gets transported to that world. He has to remain in character throughout and stick to the rules and mustn't let on that he is from a different reality. If you haven't seen Pleasantville, watch it as soon as you can, it's a superb film. There's a lot in Pleasantville that demonstrates he could take on the character of Spider-Man and especially Peter Parker. Toby has a natural talent to show his emotions and playing a nerdy character seems to come with ease for him. When it comes to the wisecracking and cocky attitude of Spider-Man, that's where he falters. He doesn't have the charisma you'd come to expect from Spidey. It may be down to the writing, because he isn't given that much to say when he is Spider-Man and even through the sequels his dialogue is often limited. Andrew Garfield really nailed that side of Spider-Man, but was too good looking to be a nerdy, believable Peter Parker. Peter is supposed to be an average guy, someone who would go unnoticed at school and Toby fits nicely into that persona and character. The Green Goblin was always going to be a challenge in bringing him from the comics to a live action film. It could end up looking too scary for younger viewers or too silly for adult audiences. Finding a balance was key. What we got was acceptable, but far from satisfying. He does end up looking like what many critics compared to a Power Rangers villain. In reality, you could never sell a suit like this to the military, it's ridiculous. But with it being a comic book movie, it gets away with it. It's never explained why he becomes the Green Goblin. He takes the enhancing drugs, he loses his mind instantly, and suddenly he is the Green Goblin. The separate personality is wonderfully conveyed by Defoe, and far more scary than the silly outfit, but the representation of the Goblin is left unanswered. I suppose it's just a visual representation of his dark side. Studio ADI had done tests of different masks for Defoe to wear. What they come up with is closer in design to the comic book version and super creepy as you can see. It was a hybrid of animatronics and makeup. It was unclear whether it was a mask Defoe wore or something he turned into. I'm sure it was probably a mask he put on once he became the Green Goblin to wreak havoc on New York. The photographic style for the movie has always left me with mixed feelings. Some areas it looks like a perfect representation of the comics and has that pastel coloured design similar to Superman the movie, going with a soft filtered look. And then some scenes it has a very muddy orange look to it. The DP on the movie was Dan Burgess, who the following year photographed Terminator 3, which also exhibited a similar look with a strong use of orange, which totally didn't suit the Terminator series. Sam Raimi always tended to work with the 185 to 1 aspect ratio. The movie for the love of the game was his first feature film he did in cinema scope. You would think Spider-Man would work best in that format to capture the beautiful architecture of New York, but he decided to revert back to the standard Academy ratio of 185 to 1. It was great Sam Raimi's frequent collaborator Bill Pope made the change to CinemaScope for the sequel and part 3. It really made a huge improvement to the scale of the series and its look. The action for the most part is very good, but there isn't as much of it as I was expecting when I first saw it and still feel the same about it today. You have this big reveal in Times Square which is a fun and over the top sequence. He beats up a few thugs doing his attempts to take photos for the bugle and he saves Mary Jane from being attacked as she walks home. Those scenes are set at night and the big battle at the end is at night time as well. Spider-Man works best for me during the daytime. His brightly coloured outfit plays so well during brightly lit scenes. At night time it feels kind of a waste. 
maybe it was a choice to play it safe to hide the CGI effects. In Spider-Man 2, they thankfully had far more battles during the day. I suppose we are given so much action nowadays, we often complain they should focus more on story. With the superhero film and their eventual sequels, it's a hard balancing act. Sequels tend to amp things up more by giving us more elaborate action scenes, which can compromise the story. If the action is serving the plot, then it's perfectly fine, and Spider-Man falls into that category. But still, there are parts where we need to see more Spider-Man, instead of another conversation with his Aunt May. The Spider-Man trilogy does follow a similar pattern to the Superman movies. Sam Raimi has said a number of times the Superman films were an inspiration for him in how to approach his Spider-Man flicks. They have familiar plot points and share a similar tone. They are a bit campy in areas, colourful but respectful to the source material. Spider-Man saving Mary Jane from the Green Goblin has the classic Superman shirt rip, and it feels similar to the helicopter rescue in the first Richard Donner movie. Spider-Man 2 has him lose his powers and she finds out his true identity, just like Lois in Superman 2, and in Spider-Man 3 he turns evil in a similar vein to Superman. It feels to me like a complimentary nod or affectionate homage to those films. Spider-Man is a solid film with a more than satisfying origin story. It gives you everything you need to know about the characters and who they are and their overall importance to Spider-Man's world. They could have given us a bit more time with some of the characters, we don't get to see Peter being his nerdy self that much, and it only hints that he had a job with Dr. Connors, but lost it due to being Spider-Man, so there are parts they cut out or never elaborate on to keep the story moving. It's a shame we didn't get a definitive version of the Green Goblin, there is still a lot that needs to be done to get his character right, and not just use him as a stepping stone to bring in other villains, or see him get killed off after one movie. It's a bit like Tim Burton's Batman, Killing off the most important villain was a bit of a misstep with the sequels. Kirsten Dunst is a believable Mary Jane. Her and Toby have great chemistry. It's nice to see her fall in love with Peter and not Spider-Man. It's sad by the end he has to make the choice not to be with her because he has chosen to pursue his new life as Spider-Man and doesn't want to put Mary Jane into harm's way. The casting choices are really spot on. J.K. Simmons is solid gold in every scene. I would love a whole movie dedicated to J. Jonah Jameson. Spider-Man is an important movie to many people, especially to those who are in their 20s now. For many kids who grew up in the late 90s, their first trip to the cinema might have been to see Spider-Man, and it was their first big budget superhero experience. It made a huge impression on them like Superman the movie did to me, and like many in the early 90s with Batman. As I mentioned earlier, I was in my late teens when I first saw it. Although I had a sense of nostalgia for the character, I never really had an emotional connection to the film. I thought it was a satisfying start to kick off Spider-Man's cinematic journey. It was great to see them stay true to the comic books, but balance it out with a sense of fun and touches of seriousness. We could thankfully move on from the over-the-top and silly attempts by Joel Schumacher with his Batman sequels. Blade and X-Men both restored some faith in the comic book movie genre, but Spider-Man really enforced that confidence with the public and Hollywood were now more than desperate to capitalise on the superhero genre once again. Spider-Man is all but invincible. But Parker... We can destroy him. I can't. Betrayal must not be countenanced. Parker must be educated. What do I do? Instruct him in the matters of loss and pain. Make him suffer. Make him wish he were dead. Yes. And then grant his wish. But how? The cunning warrior attacks neither body nor mind. Tell me how! The heart, Osborne. First, we attack his heart. Harry's in love with her. She's still his girl. Well, isn't that up to her? She doesn't really know who I am. Because you won't let her. You're so mysterious all the time. Tell me, would it be so dangerous to let Mary Jane know how much you care? Everybody else knows. Hello? <laughs> Can Spider?
Spider-Man come out to play. Where is she? Goblin, what have you done? Not been so selfish, your little girlfriend's death would have been quick and painless, but now that you've really pissed me off, I'm gonna finish her. Nice and slow. This is my gift. My curse. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.